when we want Allah to guide people, we can call upon a name like Al Hadi. Yeah, Al Hadi, because Al Hadi is what? When we want our, our rizq to have barakah, we can say, Yeah, Ar Razak. Right? When we want children, for example, Yeah, Al Khalik. Right? When we want mercy from Allah, which is always, right? Ya Ar Rahman, Ya Ar Rahim. Right? And when you do that, brothers and sisters, by Allah, by Allah, your, your, your connection with your Rabb will get better. <laughs>
And we came to the point when, you know, when the when the wahi came, ikra, ikra, right? Um, and again, he he mentioned something, and I, and again, you know, you might go through, you might see the same thing again, but Allah blesses some people to think about that same thing in a different angle, right? So he said, you know, that that those first five ayahs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu it mentions about a few things. Key things, key things. It mentions about Tawheed, of course, but it also mentions about the importance of ilm, knowledge, right? That he created qalam, pen. And the pen generally is used for what? Knowledge, isn't it? And that was beautiful because a lot of the times, again, we focus on so many things in terms of our ibadah, which is fantastic. But without knowledge, those ibadah, might not be. Let me ask you actually, and I like to keep this session interactive as you probably see. What is the what is the risk? Let me see if you let me see how you answer this, brothers and sisters. What is the risk of doing your ibadah, your worship, your acts of worship that you think are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you do them without knowledge? What is the risk of that? Let me ask you. But the most him to implement this hadith in your life. Fantastic, right? Great. So let me go back to the question again. So what is the risk of doing acts of ibadah, doing your you know acts that you that you think are for pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you do them without knowledge? The ibadah not being accepted. Okay, I'm just gonna collect the answers first and then I'm gonna you know give you some sort of reply, inshaAllah. The ibadah not being accepted, okay. Um, they'll go two ways, especially if we follow cultural traditions. Okay. You keep falling into arrogance. Okay. Okay. You risk of committing bida. Okay. So bida, for those you might not know, means innovation. Bida basically means you are putting things into the religion which doesn't belong there. Okay. Um, okay. I can't feel sweetness of that ibadah. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Very good range of answers. And some of them are spot on. Okay. So if you do an act of worship that you think is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you do that without knowledge, is there a chance that act can be accepted? Yeah. Why? Because maybe that act is authentic. Right, so we do. We shouldn't say the act won't be accepted. The cat ca act can be accepted because it could be a correct action. You know what I mean. So that's that's important, right? Doing it for the sake of doing some the doing it for the sake of doing missing deeper connections. Okay, so you you'll miss a deeper connection, correct? But the most important point, and, and of course, some of you have already mentioned this, which is if you do an act of worship that you think is to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, but you do it without knowledge, you risk doing an act of innovation, like somebody mentioned, right? You risk that act can be wasted, not will be wasted. I won't say will be wasted. It can be wasted because if it falls into the category of bida, meaning innovation, then Allah will not accept that ibadah. Because as I mentioned, brothers and sisters, and this is just a reminder, we've not even gone into the series, right? And this is just to let you know, brothers and sisters, those who are joining for the first time as well, um, and those who have joined before, and I hope you understand this as well, uh, well, you'll appreciate this, which is um, with me, I like to bring different topics into the series, right? And, I, and I, other people have loved it, and I'm sure other people, the new people will like it as well. So my question to you is that what are the two things that are needed for an act of worship to be accepted by our Rabb, by our Lord, by our Allah? What are two things needed? For any act of worship to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the two things, brothers and sisters? Sincerity. So that is part of the first thing, but that's not the main thing. Intention. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, must be for the sake of Allah. Alhamdulillah. That's the most important thing. Intention, which is connected to sincerity, which is connected to, must be for the sake of Allah, which is connected to the first hadith, which I'll mention. What is the second thing, brothers and sisters? It must be commanded by Allah, done by the Prophet Sallallahu Yep, fantastic, right. And again, just to make it, you know, bigger, it, it doesn't have to be done by the Prophet Sallallahu alone, because as we know, the Prophet Sallallahu said, on, on, on one of his last khutbah, which is, I leave, and I'm paraphrasing here, I leave behind two things, right? The Quran and my Sunnah, right? And then he, of course, goes further into that, which is to say, 
Um, okay, somebody's joining us and his name is Guest or her name. Okay, I'm going to scrutinize that. Okay, so um, the Prophet Sallallahu said, I'm leaving behind two things, the Quran and the Sunnah. And what did he told us to do? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to hold on to to hold on to them tightly, even with your molar teeth, meaning just to hold on to them tightly, right? Meaning tightly, meaning like, you know, you don't go to different things. You stay on that. And then the Hadith continues to telling about the hold. Okay, somebody's mic is on. Okay, here we go. Um, somebody called guest have joined. Can you let me know, please? Or can you put in the group who you are? Um, your name, please. And is this your first time you're joining us? We just need to make sure people in this group are those who are genuine. Oh, stand by. You still haven't told me who you are. Last strike, brother or sister. Therefore, I have to remove you. I don't want to, but you need to. You can reply to me privately, uh, stand by, if you want to, right? Um, if you want to protect your identity for whatever reason. But I need to know who you are. Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ said, hold on to the Quran and the Sunnah tightly. And the Hadith continues by saying what? The way of the son of... I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. Basically, he said... Hold on to the way, his way, the way after him and the way after them, right? Meaning the Sahaba, the Tabi'un and the Taba Tabi'un. So any action that's done by these three generations, inshallah, bi'idhanillah, will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So as I said, so why did you join the series? Again, uh, uh, well, we've gone through that. Okay, now uh, point number two, three, four, I'll skip that, okay? Uh, number five, again, let's, I know we're 15 minutes into the session, but inshallah, let's purify our intention again, every single one of us, that we're here for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we're doing this to, yes, to increase knowledge, yes, to taste sweetness of the ibadah, yes, to be able to boost our iman, and there's so many different reasons, but again, 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 we're here to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and as I said before as well, be focused, if you have any other distractions, brothers and sisters, let's them away just like when we're in our salah we want to be focused um ask questions if you have while we're doing this um and of course we'll keep it interactive okay um imam and we just a quick one you know he was someone who was uh, uh, uh he was born in um uh, as you can see in in Assyria um and he passed away in Syria as well Allah. he came he, he came to uh, Allah blessed him to be in a time where there was a lot of turmoil within the Muslim Ummah um, and that's the reality of life. You know, there's always some sort of test uh, that's testing the Muslim Ummah. Um, and that's part of, of course, to see who are the true believers and who are the hypocrites, right? So whenever you see there's so many tests, and sometimes people might think, you know, if we are on the right path, if we are upon Islam, then why is our people always being tested? Like you keep going back, brothers and sisters, you know, from the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, actually, even before that, because you know, Isa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, all the prophets, they were all Muslims, of course, right? Did their people not get tested? Did their people not go through struggles? Of course they did. And the question for some people comes is, why is our ummah always getting tested? You know, if you look around the world, the people who are tested the most at the moment as well are the Muslims, are the Muslims. But those who are connected to the deen, those who read the kalam of Allah, the Qur'an, those who you know, look at the life of the Prophet وسلم, they realize that this test is part of our entry into Jannah. SubhanAllah. Right? It's about the mindset. Right? Because as we know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran, you will be tested. Right? You will be tested. And just like you said, because those before you were tested. And all of this, again, as I said, is, is part to see the main thing is to see who are the true believers and who are the munafik. May Allah protect us from this category, right? Um, I mean, Ya Rab. Okay, so uh, Imam Anawi, Rahimullah, from a young age, he was someone who didn't like to play about, who didn't like to waste time. He wanted to be, he want, he, in his heart, and again, Allah blesses people in that way. Um, he wanted to learn knowledge and spread knowledge. Learn knowledge and spread knowledge. And that's a beautiful legacy he has left behind. Allah mabarak. Um, he wrote a number of books. Naturally speaking, someone who gains knowledge wants to pass knowledge. He has written a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, books. Um, and again, this is just to give you an example of, you know, he, what was his characteristic? You know, he didn't, he didn't like, he, he slept very little. He didn't get married. Um, 
Okay, there's someone who's drawing. Sister Fatima, can you control your pen, please? Sorry, thank you. Um, okay, books and writing. So again, we are going through the 40 hadith of uh, which he has compiled, uh, but he has written a commentary on uh, Sahih Muslim as well. All right, let's quickly now go into the first hadith. Now, let me ask you, um, you know, I need to learn how do you stop people from drawing? If anybody knows how to do that, on this because last time somebody was doing it and it's probably by mistake isn't they're not doing it by purposely if anybody knows how can i stop people from drawing and stuff in zoom sessions can you please type in the message box that would be fantastic okay first hadith um can anybody tell me what was the first hadith about what was the first hadith about Let's do this. Let's do this. You can go into settings and check who can annotate. Oh, okay, okay, fantastic. Okay, I'll do that next time. I don't want to waste time. Inshallah, I'll do that next time. Jazakallah, khair, sister Amna. Can anybody quickly tell me what was the first hadith about? What was the actions are judged upon intentions? Alhamdulillah, fantastic. Jazakallah, khair. So, yep, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, and it's been narrated by who? Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu. Okay, always remember the, the narrator as much as you can. Okay, um, the actions are judged upon the intention. So you will get what you intended, okay? And of course, we said those whose intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will record that deed as that. But those who are just looking for a worldly gain, just to please, you know, their nafs in this dunya, then all you're going to get is that. All you're going to get is that, okay? And may Allah always, and again, brothers and sisters, you know, just everything, and, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before, on a daily basis, you know, don't just think, I have to go to a certain, a certain... Okay, that's fine, brother. That's fine. Bismillah. Um, on this topic of Adid, uh, on this topic of intention, brothers and sisters, don't lose out on converting. And this is very important. Don't lose out on converting your moments which you think are just worldly things to make them a act of worship. That you are doing it for the pleasure of Allah. Just keep that sentence in your mind. On a regular basis, on a daily basis, try to convert your daily chores into act of worship. And how do you do that? With your intention. With your intention. You know, when you take a moment and just say, you know, obviously to yourself to a certain extent, that, you know, you're doing this because you want to gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah? Then that act becomes an act of worship. That could be what? Washing dishes. That could be what? Eating food, subhanAllah. You do it with the intention that you're eating food so you can get strength. And with that strength, you can do your acts of other ibadah. You can provide for your family. That's a good action, isn't it? But you do it for the pleasure of Allah. You go to work. You study. You you know, there's so many moments. Even when you go to sleep, subhanAllah, can become an act of worship. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say, right? So don't lose out on these moments, brothers and sisters. Convert your daily chores into acts of worship with the intention of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just keep that in your mind, inshallah. Okay, All right, let's go into the second hadith. So again, can anybody tell me? This is the, the hadith we've been going on for the last, I think, about six sessions now. Alhamdulillah, uh, it's a long hadith, so that's the reason why. Can anybody tell me the setting of this? Uh, okay, that's fine. Can anybody tell me the setting of this hadith? Anyone? Like, what is the setting? I'm not asking you what this hadith is about. The setting of this hadith. Okay, while I'm doing that, is the hadith of Jibreel asking Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Good. So this hadith is sometimes called the the the, the hadith of Jibreel Alayhi Salam. This hadith, as some um, um, you know, we know, is that it's called the mother of all hadiths. Uh, sister, yeah, it's in a gathering. Alhamdulillah. Who is in the gathering? Who is in the gathering? Who is in the gathering? The Sahabas are in the gathering. Who is the questioner? Who is the questioner? Who is asking the questions? Who is asking the questions? Jibreel alayhi salam is asking the questions. In, in the form of what? In the form of an angel? A human, okay? Very important, very important. He's come as a human, not as an angel, okay? And yesterday, actually, subhanAllah, in the Sira class, the Sheikh was mentioning, and I wanted to double-check that actually as well, but of course, you know, you go by what the Sheikh is saying, and then you want to satisfy your thing more. Um, He mentioned there was only 
two instances where Jibreel alayhi salam came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam in his original form. Okay. Other than that, it was in other form. And of course, this time he came as a human. Okay. And the one who was being questioned was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Okay. So the hadith goes by this, as you can see, that the man came wearing white, no, no traces of dirt, not from the community. Okay. Sat next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, start asking questions. Ask him about Islam. Actually, you know what, on this, and, and I, subhanAllah, with that series, and you know, Allah Mubarak, Allah is the best of planners, subhanAllah. Because the series I'm doing right now, and with them, and of, they, they've started in Kalina Majin, it actually connects to what this is about, subhanAllah. Um, okay, so, and I'll tell you how. The man asked, who is basically Jibreel alayhi salam, asked, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, inform me about Islam. Now, what, is, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam mentioned? When somebody, when, well, when he, when, when Jibreel alayhi salam asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam about Islam, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam mentioned? The five pillars, the five pillars, okay? And he mentioned the five pillars and the, the, the man said, yep, you've spoken the truth. The, the Sahaba got surprised, like, who are you to tell the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam you've spoken the truth? He is a prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi salam. Okay, then the man asked, or basically Jibreel alayhi salam asked, tell me about Iman. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi reply then? And we've gone through this in previous sessions, of course. So that's what I'm going through quickly. But again, just a reminder, the six articles of faith, right? The six pillars of faith, right? And we've gone through this. Okay, alhamdulillah. Right. Then the man asked about Ihsan. Ihsan. Okay. And I mentioned this last time in the, in the group session as well. Can anybody tell me what is Ihsan? Except for Brother Sabr. Can anybody else put a message in the group, please? What is Ihsan? According to this hadith. Not according to other interpretation, which is which is correct as well, but according to this hadith, what did the Prophet وسلم, worship like you can see Allah? Yep, basically, right? Worship like you can see Allah, and if you can't be in that sort of frame of mind, worship like you know Allah is seeing you. Okay, and that's what the uh, hadith mentions as well, right? That ihsan is that you should serve Allah as though you could see Him, because though you can't see Him, He can see you. Okay. And then the man asks, okay, so three things are done. Okay. Now, actually, before I go into the fourth thing, and because we've done it already, but I got some new knowledge, so I want to share it with you. Okay. The Sheikh in the in the in the series I'm doing, he mentioned about three things, right? Islam, Ihsan, sorry, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Now, out of these three things, is and let me ask you actually, are they all the same? Are they all the same? Meaning, if somebody was to ask you, you know, is Islam same as Iman? And is Iman same as Ihsan? So that's what I'm saying. Is Islam same as Iman? And is Iman same as Ihsan? What do you think? And I'm just going to tell you what the Sheikh said and it, it made me... Um, no, Iman and Islam are different. Okay, okay. So, so this is what the Sheikh asked as well the audience, and there were different answers coming out. And of course, the Sheikh mentioned it when he mentioned it, they clicked. Okay. So, and I, I don't want to go too deep into it because we'll we'll go away from this hadith as well. But the point is, if somebody was to ask you that is Islam and Iman the same, generally it is the same. It is the same because. Iman, as you can see from this. You don't like Safo. <laughs> maybe there's... Okay, guest, uh, I think maybe you might be having some trouble in the connection. Okay, so, according to this hadith, Iman is what? It's about the six articles of belief, which is inside the person. It's in the heart. It's in the heart. Now, Islam, according to this, this hadith, Islam is what? It's the action the person does. Right, but generally it can be the same, right? Because when somebody asks you about Islam, like the the big Islam, I'm talking about the big Islam. Somebody asks you about Islam, you are going to mention both. You are going to mention the six articles of faith, and you will be mentioning the five pillars of Islam. So generally it's the same. However, and this is what the Sheikh mentioned is beautiful. He said, Islam, you can say it's like the first level. Okay, Islam is the first level okay iman is the second level okay because then you start properly 
internalizing your belief, right? And the Sheikh mentioned, of course, like for example, if if you see someone praise their salah, gives zakah, gives charity, you know, fast in the month of Ramadan, goes Hajj, will you say that person is a Muslim or not? What do you think? Deep questions, but just think about that. You see someone praying, fasting, giving charity, right? Is that person a Muslim or not? Okay, so I've got yes, yes. Okay. The answer is yes, of course you would. Why? Have you seen inside the heart? We can only say yes. Okay, but have you? are you able to see what's inside the heart? Are we able to see what's inside the heart? Only Allah knows. 100%, right? But we are told to do what? Judge by the apparent, right? Whatever people show us, we judge them according to that. Now, what's within someone's heart? And Allah, that only Allah knows. And this is why the matter of Iman is a matter of the heart. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Right? The matter of Iman is a matter of the heart. Right? That's between him and Allah subhanahu or her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And that's why he said, you know, Islam is the base. Anyone who says the Shahada and does all the five pillars, basically, we know that person's a Muslim. Then you go to the second level, which is Iman. Now, Ihsan is what? The third level. Right? That's the third level. Now, as Muslims, as Muslims, which level should we be striving for? Islam, Iman, or Ihsan? According to this hadith, of course, according to this context, so, Islam, Iman, or Ihsan? The highest level, okay? So, which is what? I want somebody to type it. Ihsan, right? As Muslims, we must be striving for Ihsan, right? Even if we can't get to that, inshallah, we'll be at Iman. And if not, it's in Islam. But, and this, you know what? This, is, this isn't just an Islamic thing. You know, you go to these um, mega money building courses where there's motivator motivators and influencers and they'll tell you something similar you know go for the top level go for the stars go for the clouds no they say go for the stars if you can't get the stars you'll get the clouds if you can't get the clouds you'll get the atmosphere and whatnot and so forth right so as a muslim we know we want to aim for Ihsan. We want to aim for the moment where we are feeling the sweetness of Ibadah. We're feeling the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're feeling that, you know what, one day, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun will be recited upon us. That from Allah we came and to Him we shall return. Right? And all of this comes under Ihsan. Okay? Right. Then we start going into the hour. And the hour, of course, was about uh, uh, the Day of Judgment. Um, and the day of judgment moment, brothers and sisters, as you can see, is the one where the prophet said, you don't know, I don't know. You don't know, I don't know. Because this was talking about when Yom al Qiyamah will happen. And we went through the fact that even the prophet ﷺ is making it very, very, very clear that his knowledge is limited. And there's nothing wrong in saying that. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was the best of creation. We, we, we have no hesitation to say that. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was blessed with a lot of knowledge. But there were certain things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept it to himself. And this is one of those things. Where is? When Yawm al will happen. The Prophet ﷺ didn't know. Jibreel ﷺ didn't know. Isa ﷺ didn't know. None of the prophets, none of the creation of Allah knows and will know when exactly the day of judgment will happen. Okay, then the, the man asks, okay, tell me about the signs at least, right? Tell me about the signs at least. So now I'm going to go into the big screen. I know we're half an hour into it, but Alhamdulillah, I'm sure you've gained lots of knowledge already. Okay, so last time, look, two sessions before, we talked about this, which was um, the fact that uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, one of the signs is that the slave girl will give birth to her mistress. Now, can anybody give a message? What does this mean? When you read this, what does this mean? What is this referring to? And of course, these signs are not... Okay, let me ask you actually. Are these good things or bad things that the Prophet ﷺ is going to mention? Are these good signs or bad signs? 
are these they're bad signs you know generally speaking when we think about you know the minor signs and the major signs that are that will lead up to the to the to the to the day of judgment they're generally speaking bad signs there are good signs as well like for example the major sign of isa alayhi salam coming back that's a fantastic sign right isa alayhi salam defeating the jah that's a fantastic sign alhamdulillah but there are some major signs and even minor signs which are not good signs what's going to be mentioning here is not a good sign it's not a good sign so this sign here which is the slave girl will give birth to her mister subhanallah what 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 can we take out from this can anybody tell me of course we have discussed this before but i want to just do it again inshallah what can we take out from this what example can we take out from this which as we've mentioned already it has been happening you know recent times and it's happening right now and it will continue to happen because it's a sign it's a sign that it will it's it's leading up to the yom al-qiyamah but what is this referring to what is this referring to? What is this exemplifying? And I hope other people can answer as well. I don't want to pick people, but I need everybody. Disobedient kids. Okay, subhanAllah. So, yep, yep. So, you're looking at you're looking at the relationship between children and parents. Yep. So, basically, just to say that, you know, who will be the boss? The parents or the children? Who will think they are the boss? Authority over parents. Yep. So, children will 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 have this sense of they feel they have more say in what should be done in the house for example right they feel they have more control over their life they feel that the parents don't know any better right so all of these things and you see that around you you see that around i mean i mean when we were kids you know may Allah protect us um i don't know about you i'm 40 years old alhamdulillah when i was a child especially for a father you would never say anything back to your father, right? To your mother is something else because mothers are lamabatic our mothers. May Allah bless our parents. May Allah bless our parents, right? But now it's, it's a different story, isn't it? Because there's a risk of children, you know, going away or authority coming in. And there, there are certain things which are done, which is good, but there's, it's, 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 it gets out of control. Anyway, but it's not just to children and parents. It's, as I said before, it's about teachers and students as well, for example. Think about that. It's about, you know, to a certain extent, uh, uh, employer and employee to a certain extent, right? Employees have more rights than employer, right? Uh, employers are just, you know, always on the edge, you know, uh, how's the employee's mindset? And some of the employees are taking that, are abusing the system, basically, aren't they, Right? They think, oh, well, the boss can't say anything to me because if he says something to me, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. You know, call the, so, you know, call the whatever department, HR department or whatever. And it becomes a vicious circle. So again, brother and sister, these are signs for us to ponder upon to see, you know what, we're living in those signs. And, um, and of course, uh, uh, the, the lesson for us, of course, is that when you see this, you make dua, of course. Our biggest, our biggest tool Against these signs are is our dua. Learn the duas of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Rabbi habli min aswalihin. Rabbi habli min aswalihin. Very short dua. Rabbi habli min aswalihin. Meaning what? O Allah, grant me righteous children, right? Grant me righteous offspring, not just children, but offspring. You know, as Muslims, we want sadaqah jariya. We want you know, our, our our good deeds to continue even after we're gone. And as we mentioned in a previous session, that one of the best way to have Sadaqah Jariya, continuous charity, while we are gone, while we're in our grave, is what? A child making dua for you, right? But that child doesn't have to be your child, could be a grandchild maybe, inshallah, right? And you continue to reap the benefit. You know, knowledge that you have spread to your child and your child spreads to his child and so on and so forth. Inshallah, if you have the right intention, Allah will continue to give you that reward, right? Look at Imam Anavi Rahimullah, just an example, because we're talking about his hadith, his, his compilation of hadith. He's in his grave. He's in his grave, right? But we're still, we're still talking about him in good words. And that's what we want for ourselves, don't we? So make du'as, brothers and sisters, learn the du'as of the Quran, learn the du'as that the Prophet Sallallahu made. Of course, can we make other du'as? Of course we can. Can we make du'as in other languages? Of course we can, right? But the best du'as are the du'as of the Prophets, which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has recorded, 
has preserved in the Quran. Right? Can you imagine how powerful those du'as were? How beloved those du'as were to Allah? That Allah recorded those du'as in the Quran and people continue to recite them even after those prophets are gone. And I'm talking about the du'as of Ibrahim alayhi salam. I'm talking about the du'as of Yusuf alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam. We recite these du'as before we started the session. What did I say? Rabbi zidni ilma. Rabbi zidni ilma. Right? I recited the du'a of Musa alayhi salam as well. Right? Rabbi srahli sadri wa isirli amli wa halul uqtatam lisani yafqo qawli. Right? So these du'as, brothers and sisters, they're very important. And as I said, the du'a you need to make for your children are so important. Um... I mean, this is, um, uh, you know, a topic which is very deep. But, you know, the du'as of the parents, brothers and sisters, the du'as of the parents are so high when when it comes to, you know, the du'as that are being accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So be careful what du'as you make for your child. Even when you get, yeah, and this is just a side note, even when you get in moments of frustration, Children frustrate you. One of our children, and they do frustrate you. They test your patience. They test your sabr, right? But always make good du'as for your children, right? Whether it's the du'as for guidance, whether it's du'as for success for them in this world and the hereafter, whether it is du'a Rabb Rabbana hablana min azwaj na wadriyat na qurrat ayn wajalna lil muttaqina imama, right? The, 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 your, your children become the coolness of your eyes. They become ambassadors of Islam. The, so all of these du'as are so, so important. Um, Sister Amna, so if your parents are non-Muslim or don't like having you. Okay, so this is, a, again, a sensitive topic. But again, even if you have non-Muslim parents, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may al-hadi. Al and all this is another side mode. Learn the names of Allah. Learn the names of Allah and call upon Allah using his beautiful names. Yes, the best name of Allah is, well, let me ask you actually, what is the best name of our creator? What is the best name of our creator? Rahim, Isma Azam. Okay. Can anybody else say it? I'll give one more chance. What is the best name of our creator? Al-Rahman. Okay, standby has replied. Al-Rahman. Okay. The best name, and, I, and I, if you look at my question, I'm asking you again, what is the best name of our creator? The best name of our creator is Allah. Jazakallah khair, Sister Aksa. Allah. It was a trick question. It was a trick question. That's his best name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But he has given us, of course. Now, let me ask. I might have asked you this before. Does Allah have only 99 names? Does Allah have only 99 names? No, he has many names, right? He has many names. But he has described himself in 99 names or so on and so forth. There are There's a difference of opinion. But he definitely has more than Jazakallah, like I said, Sir Jenny. Uh, but the point is, we need to call upon him using his different names. So when we want people, when we, when we want Allah to guide people, we can call upon a name like Al-Hadi. Yeah, Al-Hadi, because Al-Hadi is what? The one who guides, right? When we want uh, our, our rizq to have barakah, we can say, Yeah, Ar-Razak, right? When we want children, for example, Yeah, Al-Khalik, right? When we want mercy from Allah, which is always, right? Yeah, Ar-Rahman, Yeah, Ar-Rahim, right? And then when you do that, brothers and sisters, by Allah, by Allah, your, your, your connection with your Rabb will get better. It's like when you call your children with different names or your wife and your husband with different names. There's the, there's a the mahabba. There's a love it flourishes, doesn't it? Right? So why why can we not do that with our with our with, our, with the one who deserves the most love from us, which is Allah, right? But all but again, that can only happen if you, you know, take time and learn about him. So anyway, let's go back to the hadith. Um again, all of this that I'm mentioning inshallah is to improve our knowledge. And to build a better connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so this hadith, uh, so the first time we've done it. Second sign, and we went through this last time as well, uh, which is uh, another sign that the Prophet sallallahu mentioned is that you will see the barefooted ones, the naked, uh, the destitute, the herdsmen of the sheep competing with each other in lofty buildings. SubhanAllah. Now, I've asked this before, but let me ask you again. Who do you think is this referring to? 
which community is this ref referring to? The Arabs. Okay, the Arabs, basically the one in Middle East, because that's the setting that the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning here. You know, the Prophet ﷺ could have mentioned anyone. He could have said the white Caucasians. He could have said, you know, the, 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 the African brothers and sisters, right? He could have said the Chinese, for example, the Indians. You know, he could have said so many different communities. But he picked the Arabs, right? And this is sometimes important, brothers and sisters. When you look at these hadiths or these ayahs, you need to sometimes ponder at, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet sallallahu could have said this, 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 this. And that could be anything. But they decide to do this. It's like, for example, the first ayah of the Quran is Iqra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have, you know, and I and I say this to even, especially to, when I'm giving da'wah to non-Muslims, I say to them, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said to, uh, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, a belief. In the first ayah could be belief. It could be pray. It could be obey. Because that's something we need to do as Muslims. But the first ayah, out of his wisdom, right? al alim Al-Hakim, right? His wisdom. He's, he, was, he decreed for the first ayah to be real from the Quran was Iqra, seek knowledge, which is beautiful, of course. And so this again, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, the, the, the description he used here is pointing towards the Arabs. And of course, we know, and this is not to, na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, this is not to, you know, badmouth anyone, na'udhu billah, this is just to take lessons from these from these uh, from these examples, brothers and sisters. Which is the point here is mainly about that they will be competing in lofty buildings. So those and look at the way the Prophet Sallallahu described them. You know, barefooted, naked, destitute, herdsmen of sheep. Now, when you look at these examples, do you feel these are descriptions of poor people or rich people? The description mentioned here by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, is this description of people who are who will be regarded as the poor people of the society or the rich people of the society? They, of course, they will be considered the poor people of the society. No, what I'm mentioning here: barefooted, naked, destitute, sheep herdsmen. This description is people, generally speaking, of those who are poor in the social sense. You know, they might be rich in terms of their ibadah and stuff. I'm talking about the social sense. They are the poor of the community, right? But look at, look, and the, to be honest, this is actually a prophecy. These, you know, these signs are called the prophecies as well, to be honest. And these examples you can actually use when you're giving da'wah as well. You know, like, for example, the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ. This is actually part of the miracles. So when somebody asks you, you know, um, um, Musa alayhi salam, he did this, he did that. Isa alayhi salam did this, did that. Right, you know, for example, uh, Musa alayhi salam, of course, the, the stick to a to a to a snake, um, and of course, all of this is happening by the power of Allah. What are the miracles of? Uh, actually, let me ask you. Actually, what is the, the most important miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? The Quran. <laughs> the Quran is the most important miracle. The Quran supersedes anything, right? He is the spokesperson of the Quran. And that's it, right? But there are, of course, other things as well. And this here is part of the package, right? So keep this in your mind as well. When people ask you, uh, uh, or actually you, you can even use this to use for things like proving that he was a prophet of Allah. SubhanAllah, right? Proving that he was a prophet. There's so many examples, of course. The Quran itself is a proof that Muhammad is a prophet of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa Keep this in your mind. The Quran itself is a proof that Muhammad is a prophet of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa And of course, I can go deep into that, but ugh, there's so much I want to say, but I'll keep it to this. Okay. So anyway, going back to this, the poor became the what? Raising lofty buildings. You know, those people who want to compete in raising lofty buildings, would you regard them as poor people or rich people? What do you think? The people who want to compete in building lofty buildings, would you would you think of them as poor, poor rich? So the people or the poor are going to become the richest, right? And is and I asked you this last time as well. Is there anything wrong in becoming rich in the dunya? 
Is there anything wrong in becoming rich in the dunya? No, no. And this is very important, brothers and sisters, because sometimes, you know, some people, because they get into this mindset that being a Muslim, you need to be living a, a very uh, struggling life, you know, a very poor life, a very downtrodden life. That's not the reality. <laughs> you know, Allah blesses people in different ways, you know. So th those people who are poor in terms of money, they might be rich in terms of family relationships. They might be rich in other ways, right? But those who are rich in money, they might be poor in terms of, you know, peace of the heart, for example, right? So money is not a sign that you are doing well, right? We know that. So being good, you know, striving for richness, getting more money in your in your bank account or living a better, you know, striving for a better lifestyle. As a Muslim, as a practicing Muslim, can you do that? Of course you can. Of course you can. You know, there are prophets who ruled kingdoms. There are Sahaba who, you know, had lots of money, right? And Allah blessed them because they worked hard for it. But, and this is the but, it goes back to two things I mentioned earlier in the beginning, which is, number one, you are striving for a better lifestyle. You're striving to get more money, inshallah, for pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is tough sometimes because... You know, there's so many things that come in your mind. You know, I want to get more and more money because I want to get a better house. I want to provide for my children. I want to, you know, get a better car maybe. You know, whatever that might be. But just keep checking yourself that the intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, oh, and this is where, but this, this is very important. This is where knowledge is powerful. Because if you can connect something you're doing to a hadith or to a Quranic ayah, inshallah, bi'idhanillah, that becomes a, an act of worship, inshallah, inshallah. Because you're doing it because thinking, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with me if I keep working out. And as we know, actually, you know what? Think of the hadith. Keep this, keep this, keep this hadith in your mind. Um, whereby the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the one who does this is better than the one who does this. SubhanAllah. Right? This is the example between rich and poor. Okay? And I mean, he said that there's goodness in both of them, of course. But he said the one who does this is better than the one who does this. What is this? What, 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 do, you, what do you take out from this? What do you take out from this? I was really hoping I'm gonna, I am going to, you know what, brother? I am going to finish this hadith today. I know we've got about 10, 15 minutes. I'm going to give this giving hand. Okay, right, giving hand. Okay, anything else? So the Prophet said, and this is connected to this hadith, to be honest, that the one who does this is better than the one who does this. What's that? What is, what is the Prophet وسلم, implying? Being rich is better, okay. Yeah, basically, if you're able to give money, if you're able to support people with money, is better than being a person who's asking. Get yeah, that's it. Better to give than to read. Jazakallah, working hard for your risk. Alhamdulillah, fantastic. This is basically one of the um, uh, lessons from this type of hadith. The Prophet sallallahu also said, "The stronger is better than the weak." Even though there's goodness in both of them. But he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the stronger is better than the weak. And the scholars, of course, has taken this hadith and given lots of different examples. Um, of course, stronger, weak comparison could be stronger in Iman is better than the weak. Of course, stronger in strength, right? As Muslims, we shouldn't be weak. We shouldn't be weak in our body. We should be strong Muslims, right? And that's what the Sahabas were. They were strong Muslims. They weren't weak because... When you have a strong body, it helps you spiritually as well. And those who go to exercise, who goes to gym, who watch their diet, you know who you are. You know how it feels when you're fit. Not, 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 um, not uh, what do you call it? Not big, but fit, right? Someone who is thin is not fit. It might be unhealthy, right? So yeah, working hard and all of that comes under that. So as I said, brothers and sisters, you know, but, but in this example, of course, the, the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning the poor and the rich, not in a good way, not in a good way.
because he's doing that because that the people will just want to compete and compete and compete not for the akhirah subhanallah not for the akhirah i, I mean look sorry sorry let, let, let me take that back allah knows best right we can't judge anyone and we, we don't want to you know call people and that's not what a muslim does but the point being made here is that they'll be competing with things that probably is not going to benefit them you know building lofty buildings inshallah there is benefit in that you know builds a better community but it's about the intention it's about the intention as we said right so uh, when we do good things brothers and sisters yes we want our society to prosper of course we do nobody likes a society that continues to be dependent upon others we don't like that we don't like that we want our societies to be dependent upon themselves independent right uh, but of course, this hadith is not a good. It's not a good sign, right? And and the point is that that you know, um, the love for the dunya can get into the people. Um, the love for commercialism gets into the people. The love for being arrogant and having that ego gets in, into the into the heart of the people, right? And that's what we need to fight. That's what we need to fight. And th this could be, and we can apply this in our lives, brothers and sisters. You know, when Allah blesses us with, for example, more wealth. A better house, uh, a, a, a higher, a higher status job, for example, better education, knowledge, for example, all of these things, children, for example, clothes, whatever that might be, right? We might not be building lofty buildings, but we are probably having some things which other people don't have, and in that situation, we shouldn't be people that become, uh, of course, arrogant. Uh, we should still be humble, and we should make dua. That Allah blesses other people with these kind of things if, and this is the big if, which is, if it will be good for them. Yeah, if it will be good for them. Because as we know, brothers and sisters, sometimes um, things that we think will be good for us can sometimes become bad for us. Think about that. Sometimes some things which we think may be good for us may sometimes become bad for us. And we know that. Just think about your life. You know, there's certain things in your life that you think, ah, if I had that, It'll be good for me. But you get that. It doesn't become good for you. <laughs> because as we know, Allah knows. Allah knows. So we always make dua that Allah gives us what's good for us. Whether that's small, whether that's big, that doesn't matter. We want Allah to give us what's good for us in our dunya and our akhirah. Agree? Of course. Okay. Um, right. So let's look at the last part of the thing. I think the last part. Oh, oops. Sorry. Okay. Last part of the Hadith. Because last night, next time I want to go into to, uh, Hadith number three. Okay. Thereupon, the man went off. I waited a while. Now, who is the I? Who is the I here? So, this person is saying, the man went off. Meaning, the man left. Okay. After asking about these four things, the man left. I waited a while. Who is the I? If you read the hadith continuing, you'll see that. But yeah, let's see. <laughs> Who is it? I, I wait Umar ibn Khattab because it says, okay. So I waited for a while. And then he, the Prophet wasallam, said, Oh, Umar, do you know who that questioner was? I replied, Allah and his messenger know best. And before I show you the answer, just, just give me a couple of minutes on this, on this, on this paragraph here first. So let's look at let's 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 unpack it as they say, right? So the man came, sat next to the Prophet, asked, asked four questions. The Prophet replied, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The man kept saying, Yes, you're right, yes, you're right, yes, you're right. Right? And what did the man do? He left after that. He didn't stay there anymore, he just left. Okay. Then Umar Umar ibn Khattab is saying he waited for a while. He didn't become hasty in asking. Prophet of Allah, what was that all going on? You know, and this is, and again, a reflection for ourselves, brothers and sisters. You know, as time keeps going, we are sadly speaking, and all of us are in this trap right now where we are becoming more and more hasty, where we're, we're becoming more and more impatient in different things in our life. We want everything like instant noodles. <laughs> we want everything instantly. We want instant knowledge. We want inst instant rich, you know, everything in life we want instant. So Umar ibn Khattab, if you just notice, and Umar ibn Khattab is Umar ibn Khattab, you know who he is. You know, he wants, he's a brave person as we know, right? He waited, subhanAllah. He waited. And then, did he ask the Prophet 
No, look at the hadith. It says, and then the Prophet وسلم, asked Umar, subhanAllah, right? He didn't ask the Prophet وسلم, because he thought, okay, whatever has happened, there must be some hikmah behind it. And that's another thing we can take back from this hadith, which is, you know, we, pondering over the, the, the wisdoms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing certain things, right? So Umar ibn Khattab must have realized that there must have been some hikmah, some wisdom behind what, what have just happened. And he didn't want to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was that about? Even though you could, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa could have mentioned something, but it's just these little things can make a big difference as well, which is showing that Umar ibn Khattab was patient, right? He wanted to observe sabr, okay? And then the Prophet ﷺ asked Umar, do you know who that questioner was? And why did the Prophet ﷺ do that? Because the Sahaba are there, not just Umar, the Sahaba are there, right? And of course, he wanted to make this hadith to become the hadith of Jibreel ﷺ, of course. The reply of Umar ibn Khattab was, Allah and His Messenger know best. And this is a reply, as we know, those who read into the life of the Sahabas, most of the time, if not all the time, um, the reply of the Sahaba, whenever the Prophet ﷺ asked them, who, what, when, where, why, you know the five W's and the one H, right? Whenever the Prophet ﷺ asked them the, this type of question, the reply was generally speaking, Allah and the Prophet knows best, ﷺ. And this is what we need to go back to as well. You know, whatever fixed things for the Sahaba is going to fix things for us, brothers and sisters. We don't need new things, right? And this is a very, very important point. You know, sometimes, and there are a group of people who are doing this, they want to get this new type of modern type of Islam. We don't need that. <laughs> we don't need that. You know, there are scholars who said, what fixed things for the previous generations of Muslim will fix things for this generation of the Muslims. Allahu Akbar. And it's so true, isn't it? Right? We're still the same. They're still human beings, aren't we? They were human beings. We're human beings. They had wants and desires. We had wants and desires. They had issues. We have issues. Right? They have blessings. We have. So the 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 the, the, the bigger picture is pretty much the same. You know. <laughs> so whatever fix for them, will fix for us. And the point here is that whenever you're not sure about something, whenever you're not sure about something, seek knowledge. Don't start you know making things into. Uh, I think this happened because of this, especially when it comes to the matter of the deen. Especially when it comes to the matter of the deen, right? Making something halal, making something haram, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. And the previous people, especially the Jews, they were um, condemned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this particular uh, action they did, right? Which is making things halal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make halal. Or making things haram, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make haram, right? So it's very important we keep going back to Allah and the Prophet sallallahu Okay, so the, the Umar al Khattab said, look, I don't know. I don't know. What well, I mean, in generally, he didn't say, I don't know. Obviously, he didn't know as well. Um, he just said, look, you, you know best, ya, ya, ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Okay, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa replied, it comes up, yeah, that was Jibreel. That was Jibreel. He came to teach you your religion. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. He came to teach you your religion. Right? And this is why the scholars say that the religion is what these four questions are compiled about. And this is why. Can you see why this is called the mother of all hadith? The mother of all hadith. Because of this particular last sentence. To teach you your religion, subhanAllah. So you know when you, whenever you give da'wah, or whenever you want to remind yourself, what is Islam? Right? What is Islam? And so much that can be said. But I always go back to what just what was mentioned in this, the, 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 especially of course the first two, Islam and Iman. Ihsan, the hour and the signs of the hour, of course they're important as well, no doubt is mentioned here. Um, but yeah, um, okay, so I'm just going to quickly wrap it up now because it's, you know, uh, 8 o'clock here. That's fine. Those who need to leave, you can leave, Bismillah. Uh, but let me just ask you before you leave, brothers and sisters, do you, uh, sorry, if you have any questions, you can put questions. But most importantly, I like to ask, and you know this as well, which is, 
can everybody tell me what did you learn today? And this hadith is finished now. Alhamdulillah, we have done it. We have done it. We've finished hadith number two. Okay, can everybody tell me what did you learn today? Or what did you benefit from today? And I want everybody to reply, please. Okay, uh, Sister Mazian, Islam, Iman, and Isan. Okay, Alhamdulillah. So, which was mentioned in the you know in the last seven sessions as well, but that's fantastic. Uh, converting daily chores into active worship. Jazakallah khair the seven. That's fantastic, right? And Sister Nargis, that this is called the mother of Hadith, definitely. Sister Nargis, let me ask you. Nobody else replies, okay? Sister Nargis, do you know what is called the mother of the Quran? Okay, what is called the mother of the Quran? Now, everybody else, can everybody else tell me also, what did you learn from this? This, What did you benefit or learn from this session, please? So I've got three replies so far. I need other people to reply as well. Uh, Sister Nargis, good question. Yeah, it is a good question. <laughs> okay, do you know? If you don't know, you can just say. Uh, okay, you don't know. Okay, Sister Aksa has replied to you. Surat al-Fatiha. Surat al-Fatiha is called the mother of the Quran. Okay. Okay, so that's another knowledge for you, inshallah. This is this hadith is called the mother of hadith. Surah Al-Fatiha, the, the first chapter is called the mother of the Quran. Okay, so keep those things in mind. Okay, Sister Aksa, doing things for the sake of Allah. You, you benefited from that. Alhamdulillah, fantastic. Um, heart of the Quran is Surah Al-Yaseen. Yes, heart of the Quran is Surah Al-Yaseen. But the mother of the Quran is Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay, um, Brother Muazzam. What is our religion? Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that these are the core of the deen, right? Everything else comes secondary. If anybody who doesn't understand Islam, Iman, and to a certain extent, Ihsan, you are putting yourself in risk, okay? Uh, okay, Sister Mazian. Yep, wa yakum, wa alaikum salam. Jazakallah khair for joining. Um, Sister Aksa, you can leave as well. But the Muazzam, you can leave as well. Sorry, I'm teach, treating you as a teacher student. But I need to make sure you benefited, right? Sister Nargis has replied, so you can do as well. Um, anybody else who hasn't replied yet, please, can you put something? What did you benefit from this session? But the Sabir, of course, has done it as well. Uh, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Wa yakum wa yakum. Okay, I'll let you go. I'll let you go. Jazakallah khair for joining, brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our gatherings. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu la ila illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ulaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. See you next time, inshaAllah. Mm -hmm.